uh, I'm, I'm so grateful that you are my friend and, and I can always count on you. And I, and I think, you know, I believe, a high, I'm a highly believer that God brings people into your life for a person and purpose. And when he brought you and I together in 2008, we've been together ever since. And I consider you my little brother. And, you know, there's nothing I wouldn't do for you to help you in any way I can. So I agree. You. I agree completely. You, you know, we've just, it's been over a decade now, you know, and yeah. uh, we've grown together very well. Our families, uh, it, it's just, it's an amazing, it's amazing friendship. And I feel like you're part of the family. Same here. I, I tell everybody, I have a little, a, a younger white brother and people say, what, what? I'm not, I do. Yeah. And so it's a, a wonderful story to tell, but, but thank yeah. you so much for doing this with me today. So I'm going to start off by asking you a question. Can you tell me a little about, about yourself? Tell me what your name is, your family, your, your anything, where you grew up, anything you want to share that kind of helps us get to know you. Sure, sure. Uh, so my name is Dan Cantrell. I grew up in Detroit, well, not in Detroit, Michigan, but in the suburbs of Detroit, Michigan. And, you know, my, my parents raised us to be thoughtful and ethical, and they were always supportive uh, of our choices. And, uh, you know, I, th I remember growing up, the, the one thing that was always consistent was, you know, my parents would tell me, you, you can do every, any, anything you want if you just try hard enough, if you're persistent. And I, you know, I think that that kind of support is really what allowed me to succeed in life. Uh, you know, and now I have a family. I try to raise my kids with, uh, <clears throat> you know, good uh, intentions, ethics, uh, a belief in, you know, a belief in religion. Uh, so I think that, you know, it's very important to me how I was raised, and I'm trying to pass that on to my kids. And uh, I came to North Carolina about 11 years ago, and uh, that's when we met at uh, working at Duke together. And, you know, we came here because we thought this would be a great place to raise a family. Um, we had two kids, uh, they're now in middle school, and uh, two girls, they're, they're really smart. I think, uh, um, you know, obviously every parent wants to say their kid is smart and will be successful, but I, I'm, you know, I just have such high hopes for them. I know that they're they're just amazingly capable at uh, accomplishing whatever they put their mind to, and it, it really makes me proud. Well, I think you're a wonderful father and a wonderful friend. Um, so you grew up, so outside of Detroit, not, not, not in Detroit, but outside of Detroit, can you tell me what your experiences were as you grew up and, and specifically uh, and the people you interacted with, uh, philosophies that you and your family shared, kind of, uh, can you share some of that? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, my, my mom worked in a hospital her whole career. Uh, she was a doctor and she worked in Henry Ford Hospital in downtown Detroit her whole career. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, she, that Detroit was the city she grew up in. Uh, she went to school uh, there. She got her uh, degrees from University of Michigan and then she went to work in the city she grew up in. And we stayed there for, you know, pretty much her whole career was in that one place. Uh, <clears throat> you know, my dad worked with the automakers. He grew up in New York, uh, but he, he moved out to uh, Michigan to finish his school. And he worked in uh, Chrysler for a while. Uh, it was then sold off to another company. But, you know, they, they worked in the companies of Detroit in the auto work, uh, you know, auto rust belt uh, of the Midwest. Um, and I think that... You know, there were, there were a lot of things that were good in my education, but I think there were a lot of missing things in my education. You know, we're, we're talking today about uh, diversity, and I, I didn't have a, a lot of exposure to diversity as a kid. Um, you know, the, the saying, you know, is that I, I'm from Detroit, but I'm from the suburbs of Detroit because the saying was that people fled the city. Um, and that's, I think... Uh, a terrible way to put the the way people are moving in and out of cities. I, I think it's very sad that people are fleeing a city when they, they feel that they, they need to go to another life, get, get to opportunity outside of the city. It's, uh, it's an immediate negative connotation. And I think Detroit took a very long time to recover from, you know, some, some very bad connotations around it. Uh, it's sad to see the city uh, when I left it in, 90, 92, 93, it was still not doing well as a city. Um, since I've left it, there's been a lot of uh, activity, uh, economic activity, 
uh, job growth and those kind of things uh, beyond the auto industry, which is great. It did not have a, uh, a well-founded economy across many industries. It was all solely about uh, auto industry. Um, but, uh, you know, a lot of people lived in the suburbs outside of Detroit, and uh, they were they were not terribly diverse. And, uh, you know, you, you don't necessarily notice that as a kid growing up. Um, but, uh, I, you know, one of the things that I've learned from you is that, you know, the best thing to do is look for what's missing. And when you start observing what's missing, you can then start asking questions as to why. Why are we not, you know, seeing an equal share of uh, diverse people around us? Um, you know, why are there not more women leaders in, in uh, this industry of technology that we work in? Yeah. When, would you consider your upbringing middle class or upper middle class? How would you describe your upbringing? Uh, I guess upper middle class. Uh, yeah, we were in a uh, very well-to-do neighborhood with very good schools. Um, the, I guess the, the common theme is that I was able to go and do what, you know, I needed to do. I didn't have to worry about, um, you know, where uh, my next meal, meal was going to come from. I didn't have to worry about, uh, did I have to get a job as a, a teenager? Um, I did get a job uh, in high school. I did work part-time in college. But those were really just to further my career, and there were uh, uh, more of an opportunity than a necessity. Uh, my parents had uh, done very well preparing for uh, the eventual college uh, payments that they'd have to do for four kids. Uh, some some of those kids went to you know undergraduate and graduate school. I only did my undergraduate. But uh, you know, it's a, a significant expense. They were able to prepare for that and plan for that all along as their career went on. So they knew that they had to prepare for that and they were able to provide until I was out of college and I was able to get my own job in, in a booming industry of the technology sector. Would you say all of the extracurricular, extracurricular activities that you did led you to be the brilliant man that you are? Or because or, or, I, I know you're uh, an avid reader, podcast, listen to a lot of good podcasts. And I tell almost every person I know, you're probably one of the smartest men I know. Um, and uh, even when you're not particularly familiar with the situation, it doesn't take you long to grasp and then come up with a, a resolution. So do you think that that is because of the things that you did while you were growing up and, and, and the jobs and, and things you did while you were in college? Or is that just uh, I think it's I think it's primarily the encouragement of my parents to always push us to to learn. Uh, I think that that is. I, I think there are a lot of other things that people can do with their time. Uh, you know, I get distracted by all sorts of things that are are definitely not learning activities. Uh, there's lots of fun things we can do out there, uh, but my parents were very type A driven people. And we definitely inherited that uh, ethos from them that, uh, you know, you can always be learning, you can always be improving yourself. Um, you know, my dad was born at, at the time of the Great Depression. And they say that depression era babies, they, they held on to that experience forever. Um, so my parents really did push hard to, to make us self-sufficient. They did push hard to encourage us to expand our, our boundaries, to go and, and reach our achievements. Um, and, you know, if you, if you get that constant reinforcement as a child, I, I think that made most of the difference in, in how I pursue knowledge, how I pursue my career, how I pursue my, my religious life, my family life. Uh, I think I really did get it from my parents. Very, very good. So let, let, let's change gears uh, from, for a moment. From Michigan to North Carolina, have you ever faced or incur, incurred discrimination or racism or microaggression? Have you ever experienced that? I don't, I don't think I have, no. Uh, I, I can't say that I have. Um, you know, as being a middle-aged white male and, you know, balding, I'm, I'm pretty average, so. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm fortunate that I haven't been uh, 
the, on that side of uh, aggressive uh, tactics, uh, I've I've never been in a position where I've I've had to significantly compromise my beliefs to accomplish something. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've been very fortunate in in my work and my career. Uh, I've had the ability to uh, you know run my own business and and be my own boss. I've had uh, senior leadership jobs. I've worked as a entry level programmer. Um, I've been across the spectrum, but I, I've never really had to deal with anything like what has been described by so many people uh, as as to the inherent, uh, you know, the, the inherent uh, racism and uh, suppression of yeah. people's basic rights. I mean, that's not something I've had to experience. How would you define dis discrimination or racism? Well, I think that uh, I think that racism is a type of discrimination. I think discrimination. Uh, there's many types of discrimination where somebody is actually uh, taking away or disadvantaging somebody uh, purposefully, um, and racism is obviously a, a form of discrimination. And I think that that you know that violates a basic human law. You know, we should. We should treat each other equal. We should be fair to people. Uh, we shouldn't judge based on race, sex, ethnicity. Um, each people, uh, each person is an individual with their gifts, and you know they're they're they should be treated equally with other people. So here here's a, our personal question: If if I was if the police had their knee on my neck, what would that mean to you? I would think but, that would be a, a cruel and and you know terrible thing for someone to do to another person. I mean, I I think I would take action. I would hope I would take action. I would step forward and say that's not right. I I probably wouldn't be able to stop a police officer who is an armed individual, uh, but I I would hope that I would take action to defend the the right of an innocent person, a uh, person to live. And a person that's a part of your life, a close part of your your life. Well, I think that you know you you have to you have to defend the the innocent. Uh, if it's a person you know, if it's a person you know that's close to you, obviously you're you're going to have a lot more feelings as to why you're defending that person. But you know, life itself is worth defending. Excellent. And so, considering me now, Mr. Floyd, so. Do you have that same view for Mr. Floyd, who, who we did not know? Oh, ab absolutely. Uh, you know, when you see what was happening, uh, you can't not think this is wrong. You can't not think that if you respect life, if you respect a person's life. Um, and I, I think that, you know, that's uh, going to take a long time for people to come to terms with that this has been happening for a long time. We know that this has been happening for a long time. Uh, and it's, it's unfair and it's not gonna be easy to change. You know, if you think about the, the time that, that we've had since um, you know, the Civil War to uh, voting uh, rights for minorities, I mean, this is all within a few generations. If I look at my dad who was born in uh, the 1930s, that's that's one generation back, uh, two or three generations before that, um, the Civil War hadn't happened. So you're looking at so few generations, really, and you can see it. And uh, well, unfortunately, you see it mostly in social media. But you see a lot of these views haven't changed significantly, uh, and it's really it's really sad that it takes so much time for people to to come to terms with uh, you know, basic human dignity and respect. Very good. So um, it, in the way that you, you see and view the world, um, do you believe that all the history we have of injustices for brown and black people have, have gone unnoticed by the white majority because they thought these were one-offs or just uh, 
something that happens because a person must have done something to cause this to happen, or do you think it's uh, more systemic than that? Well, I think it's uh, it's definitely more systemic, but it's it's not unobservable. It is um, it's so deeply embedded. It's hard to see if you're a part of propagating these systemic um, you know, disadvantages. So I, I had not known much about redlining until I talked to you, and we talked about that in our past. Um, growing up in Detroit, I didn't know that was going on, um, you know, in my lifetime. And the effects of that are still ongoing. Uh, you know, you, you hear about at points in our history, there were actual words in a contract to buy a house that it could not be owned by uh, a minority person. Uh, you know, I don't think any house I've ever owned or my parents have ever owned have had that language in it, but that doesn't mean it wasn't happening around us. But because it's a systemic problem, it's, it's seeded so deeply within the society, you can not be aware of the exact acts going on around you. And you know, it doesn't, it doesn't make it not right to act on it, but that's why it is harder to take action directly. And I think that we're seeing now that people can act directly if they, if they act with intent. You know, they say, we know that this is in the system and we need to, we need to have an, a, a way to actually change this. So um, if we outlaw pre police brutality, because it is disproportionately used against one race, then that will help solve that piece of the problem. But there are so many of these, we've got to start just attacking these problems one at a time until we can say that we've, we've started making progress until we can say we've had success. Um, a lot of people will just simply say, oh, the problem's too big to solve. There's no one right answer just to solve it all. And that's undoubtedly true. That's why we have to try many things and we have to be diligent about it and we have to be truthful about it. Uh, so many times in the media, we'll see that people will just outright deny the truth. Uh, that's the first thing that we have to correct is that, you know, if, if this is happening and you know, we can't allow people to, to change the truth for their benefit uh, just because they don't think it's convenient, and uh, there hasn't been a lot of accountability. There's not a lot of humility out in the, in the media right now. And I think that makes all of this so much harder. But you can see that people are out in the streets. They want change. Uh, that is the will of the people. But it's hard to get that message through, um, especially with the way media can distort a lot of what's going on. Let me ask you two questions that may be a bit uncomfortable, but let me ask. Have you ever heard, used, or been in company of someone that used the N-word? I don't think so. I probably have heard it in public before, but I, I can't think of a specific instance of that, no. Mm -hmm. That's very good. And then the other uncomfortable question I have and I've heard a lot of this from my friends who call me, my white friends have called me and asked me, why is it so important that black lives matter? Do not all lives matter? What's your position on that? Well, I've already said that all lives matter, but I think that they're distorting the message when they say that, or try to change the message to all lives matter. I think that it is important that you say black lives matter. I think that is what the message is at its core because it is saying that we are acknowledging that there is an injustice. And the only way to acknowledge that is to state it clearly, black lives matter. Um, and I don't think anybody should take offense at that. It's definitely not saying somebody else matters less, but if you can't admit that black lives matter, you're not really understanding the core principles at play here, that we need to acknowledge that we are equals, that we have equal justice. Well, we have the, 
the opportunity for there to be equal justice, but we do we not deserve right. right. We all deserve right the equal justice. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, in 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 light of what we've seen with Mr. Floyd and, and countless other black and brown people dying at the hands of law enforcement, many people have raised with me, well, there's black on black crime. Why is that any different? And uh, I've always tried to answer that the best I could was that, you know, there's all color on all, white people kill white people, black people kill black people, Latino people kill Latinos. I mean, this is not unique to any group for whatever reason that someone kills someone, they kill them. But when you're in a position of power, sort of like you, you as a, a director, you have these people that report to you. If you treat one of your employees differently than you treat another, you're not a good manager because you have been placed in charge of these people and their, their career and their well-being. And if you're going to single out, say, the black female or the Asian male, the death, or in, in, in the instance of the question I'm asking, does have a different feel to it. Would you agree to that? I think that people who use those arguments are, again, changing the the discussion to something that they're more comfortable with. Mm -hmm. And it is, it's, it's not really what the discussion is about. Um, you know, people die falling off cliffs. Are we going to outlaw cliffs? Well, that's not the discussion we're having. Right. You know, the discussion we're having is there is a, uh, there is a systemic problem that is threatening the lives of uh, majority of uh, a disadvantaged group because of just the color of their skin. They are being disadvantaged, not giving equal justice. Right. So why is that other discussion relevant to what we're talking about? It's not. Yeah. I, I will say this. So I know your wife, I know your daughters and Susan drew, drew me a very beautiful picture, which still hangs in my office, which I haven't been in, in almost three months. But uh, I am never treated any differently by you and your family. Uh, I don't feel uncomfortable when I'm with you. Do you feel uncomfortable when you come to our, our, our gatherings where we feed people and there's a bunch of diversity in the room. Does, does that make you feel uncomfortable? Or does it make any of your family feel uncomfortable when they're in, in spaces where there may be more black people or brown people than they are white people? Uh, it doesn't make me feel uncomfortable, no, but uh, I, I may be an exception just because I'm kind of clueless about these things sometimes. Uh, I, I am a little bit more outgoing, I think. Uh, I do like to just go and talk to people. Uh, but you know, when we when we are at a party with you and your family and uh, other friends, I I think that we're all very comfortable being around you. And it's I think it's really just that uh, if you're raised not to be prejudiced, it means you're not afraid of meeting new people. You're not going into a situation with a preconceived not uh, a notion, and that. And that alone can, you know, solve a lot of that uncomfortableness. Um, I, I don't think that's uh, been a problem for me. Uh, and I don't see it in my kids, which I'm really happy for. Uh, they, they have some diversity in their school system, uh, less than probably is uh, uh, proportional for this part of the, uh, the Raleigh area that we live in. Uh, but I'm glad that they do get exposed to a wide variety of people, ideas, even the bad ideas are, are good to hear sometimes because we can have frank discussions about them. And sometimes they come from the most unusual, uh, unexpected places and you sit down and say, no, no, we don't agree with that at all. <laughs> I know where you heard it from. Yeah. That's not what we're talking about here. <laughs> no. Okay. I'm going to ask you one question. We have about three minutes. So I'm going to ask you one question and then the remainder of the time is yours to say whatever you wish to say, but my, my one question may be a bit sensitive and I certainly appreciate if you choose not to answer. But what if one of your daughters wanted to marry or date a person from another race? Would that be concerning to you? Uh, no, I don't think so. As a, as a dad, I'm gonna be concerned about what my daughters do. 
uh, but I, I trust them and they're only in middle school right now, but I, I feel it's my responsibility as a parent to give them the foundation they need to be what they were meant to be in this world. Um, <clears throat> you know, once they're 18, they, they have to be able to be an independent uh, person. Um, we always hope that uh, we, we leave them with the best of us. And, uh, you know, it's, it's not up to us to, to make their life, to make all their decisions. It's up to us to just give them the best chance they have to lead a healthy, happy, and fulfilling life. Absolutely. Anything other? Anything else you'd like to say? Uh, no, I did. I think I'd just like to say, you know, I've really cherished our our friendship. It's it's grown to be very strong. Our bond between our families is is very strong, and uh, I really feel that you've enriched my life over these years. Uh, I'm sad that we don't get to go see each other at work for the past couple of months, but I'm sure that'll that'll clear up eventually. Um, but, uh, I wish you and your family very best, uh, good health, and I hope you have a great day. I appreciate it very much. But before we end this conversation, there must be one word you have to say to me before we end. Again? Again? <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much, Dan. I will send you a copy of this recording once it's done so you can preview it. But there's nothing better than hearing you tell me again. I had this absolutely the best. And I can't wait for your daughters to say that to you. I love oh, you. Oh, they will. They will. Thank you. Bye. I, I love you. Bye. Bye. Bye.